Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for this webinar on finding meaningful work post retirement. Uh, my name is Jody Hammer, and I'm the Career Services Specialist here at the National Peace Corps Association in our Global Reentry Program. And I'm thrilled to be with you today to talk about this very important concept that you know, hopefully people are thinking about even before they're just on the brink of, of retirement or into retirement, but it's really valuable at any time. So we're going to go through several slides and I'm going to answer as many questions as I can and um, we'll, we'll take as many as I can and then we'll go ahead and uh, ask questions in the end and uh, follow up with me if you have questions thereafter. So let's go ahead and get started. So I first want to address the, the aspect of the concept of retirement having changed exponentially, right? You think about in the old I want to say the old days, but long ago, right? When our parents, our grandparents retired, right? You know, they might have, they retire at 65 or around then, and there's a big retirement party, and then boom, they never work another day in their life. It's like, it's the end. Well, that might have made sense long ago when life expectancy was around 65. So you really didn't have that much time post retirement. So you, you know, whereas in today's day and age, when you retire at, you know, 62, 65, and the average life expectancy is much greater and many outlive that. I mean, you know, if you live, you know, you retire at, at uh, 65 and you live to, you know, 95, that's 30 years. That is a very long time. So it's probably something that you want to fill with some other activity. Um, and and it's, it's, it, this is an opportunity to learn more about how you might go about doing that. So, um, and it also does of course cost more to uh, live longer, right? When you retire, you have whatever nest egg and, and whatever you've saved up and, and social security of course, which is very modest. And that's what you have. And if you're living 30 years, that's a lot less, um, you know, that money needs to stretch a lot longer. So it is important to think about potentially working beyond retirement, but it could be in something extremely different. And we'll talk about today about ways to find some of those areas um, of, of interest and how to maybe find your niche. So I, I look forward to that. The financial realities, which I've already, you know, started talking about um, are, you know, are a significant factor and many, many, you know, baby boomers, according to a study that was done in 2018 from the Stanford Center, which I've, you know, referenced here, nearly a third of baby boomers have nothing saved in a retirement account. That's really scary. Uh, because the life expectancy is longer, right? And and when you do retire, there's not that income. So, you know, that that's a reality that people are going to also need to potentially work longer if they haven't, you know, saved for retirement or augment what you've already saved. So only 40% are presently contributing to retirement plans. So you have these employment, you know, in, uh, sponsored retirement plans, that are an opportunity for you to put away some money and write on that tax deferred basis, all of that. And yet only 40% are, are doing that. Some perhaps are literally living paycheck to paycheck and others just aren't thinking about it as much and, and or intending to start, oh yeah, I'll do that this year. And then this year comes and goes and it doesn't get done. I know how that is with other things, right? So um, the financial insecurity really does play into your reality of retirement and what it looks like. So um, that can be a real reason for, for delaying it. Okay, let's keep going here. So why people keep working? We've already emphasized the financial aspect. They can't afford not to work. That may be a reality. And so we'll be talking about jobs and how to find jobs that are paid jobs, um, as well as other ones. Uh, in this as well. So the continued benefits can be a really big reason too. I mean, health insurance, as you probably all know from firsthand experience, is extremely expensive and that's a huge benefit in employment. For example, in your in your um, your employer sponsored health insurance plans and and your other benefits in federal government constitute approximately one third of your wages. It can be. It depends, but you know on how much you're, you're earning and such. But it's a huge chunk. So you want to um, you know acknowledge that you know if you can keep working and have the health insurance, that can be very beneficial, obviously. But there's a whole other 
crew of people who just love what they do and are not ready to stop. And I, I think in particular to uh, my former, one of my mentors in life, who is a mentor from the University of Northern Iowa, where I completed my undergraduate. And we have stayed in touch and she is still working at the university doing what she was doing, you know, in the alumni area relations. She just loves the connection and she travels all over and she is well into her eighties and she is healthy and she is happy. And a lot of people tell her, you need to retire. Why are you working so late? And she, you know, so long. And she says, I love what I do. Why would I retire when I enjoy what I do? And I enjoy you know, the benefits and it gives her that sense of purpose. So um, I say that to, to reassure those who perhaps aren't ready for retirement emotionally, even though you may be beyond the age of standard 65, you know, retirement when you could retire, that is okay. If you love what you do, I say, do it, stay doing it, keep doing it as long as you can, as long as you want. That's wonderful. There's other people who might fear being, you know, bored without that work structure or that typical day or those, you know, um, frequent contacts with, you know, employees. So they might be staying less for the, I love what I do and more for that, well, I'm worried I'm going to be bored. And I think that's a reason, and I'm certainly not judging any of these reasons. I think they're all valid. Uh, I think that's one of these areas that, you know, maybe you could find some other types of work that might be more fulfilling and still give you some uh, you know, income. It may or may not be exactly what you were making, right? Oftentimes when you retire, you're higher up and, and you may or may not find employment that's going to be you know, exactly at that level. And you may not be looking for that, quite honestly. A lot of people are looking for less challenge and more maybe of that connection. And that's why you see a lot of retirees who might go to work or, you know, work, maybe they're, you know, helping in a school as a teacher's assistant because they love kids and, or they're mentoring or they're working with, you know, building houses, you know, Jimmy Carter's of the world, right? Habitat for Humanity, those kinds of things. So, uh, so it's, it's definitely, there's a lot of different reasons, I guess, is what I'm saying is that people stay, you know, uh, working and, and that's fine. You know, your, your benefits, obviously of working, it can for many people be that sense of purpose as this graphic shows, right. And identity and the social interaction that I was mentioning. So let's, uh, let's look here. I have a few slides that just have some, you know, quotes and such. I, I love this Dalai Lama, um, one, a meaningful life isn't about acquiring money or other facilities. It's about dedicating your life to helping others as much as you can. And I think this is one that I would say, you know, many, many of the RPCV community can really relate to, right? You know, you didn't do Peace Corps because you wanted to earn money, a lot of money, right? You certainly didn't do that right? But you made a difference and you helped and you dedicated yourself to what you were doing. And that's why it was such a, you know, meaningful type of experience. Not that there weren't frustrations, not that there weren't whatever, but you, you did that and dedicated yourself to that because you wanted to make a difference, right? So I think that's, that's something that we share, you know, as a, a common thread uh, as, you know, returned Peace Corps volunteers. You know, the meaning, the meaning of life is to give life meaning right? It's not necessarily to just, you know, climb up that social or that ladder, right? That career ladder that gets you to the, you know, to the top rung, right? By the time you retire, that, that's not always the case, right? Some folks want to stay at a rung or two or three or four, whatever, lower than that, where they feel more compelled, or they, they feel more called, right? Or of service. And I myself am an example of that. I made a conscious decision to step away from the corporate world to really, you know, dedicate, dedicate myself. I actually went to Peace Corps after working in the corporate world, came back and, and Peace Corps was so impactful, uh, you know, on my life and my career. And it really taught me the value of like my, my most, I think, meaningful part of my career trajectory is fundamentally my Peace Corps service. It had a profound change, you know, impact on me and changed me as a person. And I know that for me, when I got to the end of my service, I, like many of you probably, felt I had 
gotten so much more than what I was able to give in those years I was there. I ended up staying for three years. And it was a humbling experience and there were challenges and all of that. But I learned so much about them. And, and one of the biggest things that I, that I learned was that, you know, it can be scary stepping away from the corporate world. I was working in the financial world where I was actually working with companies on setting up 401k plans and rolling them out and, and educating the, the workers on how they work and why they're important and, you know, that type of thing, why it's important to save. I was probably, they, they said to me, I was the first person to leave that company and join the Peace Corps. <laughs> so I was definitely unique in that regard. And I have no regrets. I have loved my, my life since, and I've made a conscious decision. You know, I, I am not, I didn't want to move up to be, you know, supervising. I, I did that and, and found that I just didn't feel as much of that sense of, um, calling. I mean, I, I enjoyed aspects of it, but I really missed the client work. So for me, it's that client career services type of work that really fuels me and, and is my energy. And so I found my niche. I don't want to move up uh, necessarily, right? I like what I'm doing right now. And so that's okay too. And I, I like to give people that example because don't feel pressured by others to, oh, you've got to reach this, this certain level by the time you retire or whatever. It really does come down to your, you know, meaning and finding that sense of meaning, which is, is different than happiness as the, as it says in the text here on this screen, you know, it's about, you know, working with others and contributing and, and all of that, which, you know, for many of you may be just as important as it is for me. So here are some questions that I challenge you to, uh, to ask yourself that can help you, um, it, it can help you think about what you want to do in retirement or what kinds of activity might be appropriate for you. Okay. So I, I put them in here and there's, um, there's, you know, thinking about first thinking about when you were a child, right? I mean, it's hard to remember so far back, isn't it? I know for myself, when I think about my young child, it's like, what? Wait, but what did you love most? What were your passions? What did you lose yourself in? When you would, you know, go outside, was it was it the earth? Was it the garden? Was it the trees? Was it books? Was it science? You know, what were the things that you really loved the most when you were a child, which is generally more of a carefree uh, time for, for many, right? It used to be. <laughs> um, so, what, you know, what did you, what did you want to be when you grew up? And of course that may change every, you know, every, uh, you know, week, but just thinking about some of those things can help, help guide you to maybe take you back to some of those areas and do some work in some of those areas. Um, you know, what would be your, your regrets on your deathbed if you never did? Right. I, uh, I have an activity that uh, I do with clients on and I call it like the 32 square, you know, um, activity where I have them fold a piece of paper, eight and a half by 11, fold it again, fold it again, keep folding it, increasing it really well until you get 32 um, squares. And then you literally write in each of the squares, what's one thing you want to do before you die? Like what, what's one thing that you want to accomplish or do? It doesn't have to be work-related. Does it, it, It's anything. For example, go skydiving, get my pilot license, um, you know, travel the world. Um, I mean, it could be anything, right? Get my PhD, whatever those items are. You just put, there's no judgment. You're just putting them one in each box. And then um, you, I have them turn it over and then literally I have them write, what's the first word that comes to mind? Uh, when you think of that activity, like why is that important for you or why is that on the list, right? So pilot license or, you know, getting, going skydiving, that might be adventure. And don't worry about having it have to be different uh, words. It can totally be the same word multiple times, right? Uh, getting your PhD might be education. And what happens is you're going to see themes that come out. And, and these themes are, are areas that, um, that would be, for example, adventure, like that's important to you in, a, in activities, in jobs and activities, things like that, or, or education or whatever, family might be another one, all those kinds of things. That's going to help you kind of guide yourself on, it can, on, on what kinds of things, um, you know, you might want to accomplish because let's face it, retirement also does take planning and boy, we could do an entire workshop just on retirement planning, which we don't have space. We don't have time for right now. Maybe we'll do that another time. 
Uh, so a couple of the other ones thinking about, you know, your, your favorite movie or book, which can tell a lot about you really, right? You know, why, you know, how does that, how does that reflect on, on what's important to you, right? Um, and the next one I really like, who matters to you? Like what's, is it, is it kids? Is it the elderly? Is it, you know, what, what's your population um, that's important for you? And then if money weren't a problem, what would you be doing now? And the great thing about retirement for, for some people, right? For many people, if you, assuming that, you know, let's say you've saved or you, you know, you're at a point where you do have that flexibility of not necessarily needing an income, but you might like one and you can certainly, you know, research alternatives and, and find something as well, part-time basis, right? But if you're not as con confined by having to earn a certain amount or whatever, it really opens you up. Like, what would you be doing if money were not an issue at all? If you could just do, you know, whatever and not worry about, uh, you know, about making a dime, that can really get into and help you tap into your core values and your core passions and things like that. And then lastly, and I think this is a really important one, you know, describing your ideal day, you know, what would you want to do? You know, would you want to do this every day, right? Could you, you know, how can you maybe make that work? Because there might be a way to do it. Um, and there's no right answer on what kinds of employment that you're going to, you know, maybe want to do. I know um, for me, our, my, my neighbor and, and also my father ended up doing this after he retired. They drove car for one of the car rental agencies and they would, you know, drive to, you know, from to a certain, you know, place he loved to drive. She loved to drive. And that was, uh, that was a, a fun job for them. And they really enjoyed it. And they got that sense of community with the people at the, you know, um, rental agency and, and just say they had a great time. So, you know, it could be something like that too. So it's different for each person. I think ultimately uh, finding your purpose is, is what people think about when, and some of you know what your purpose is. You already are very crystal clear on it. And I know some of you on here because I know who you are and the great kinds of volunteer work that you do or mentoring or resume writing or things like that. You're already well connected, which is great. And you're tapped into and doing. And I'd love to hear from any of you who, you know, would be willing to share, you know, at this point or, you know, as we go on, you can certainly put something in the chat box or, you know, uh, tell me in the chat box that you're willing to share and, and share a little bit about your own journey, you know, to finding, you know, your own kind of area of passion, right? But basically, in, in these buckets, you know, you have, sorry, I got muted there for a moment. Um, in these, you know, uh, buckets, you have, you know, you, the, the one bucket is more like dedicating your talents in service to something, you know, or someone other than yourself, right? It's, it's to an organization or population, right? A lot of people turn to kind of that spiritual aspect when they retire. Um, that's quite common. Um, others, you know, mentoring or in this picture, maybe it's somebody teaching, you know, kids how to play the piano or maybe spending time with your grandkids, you know, if you have them, things like that. So do the other really kind of, I think, bucket is that doing what you've always wanted to do. So this does not have to be tied to making a difference for somebody else because it's also important to, you know, take care of yourself and bring joy to yourself, right? So you might be the kind of person who wants to, like my uncle did, live on a sailboat, uh, you know, and literally did that for years, 10 years after he retired and absolutely loved it, traveled all over and, and would dock here and there and stay and just really, really enjoyed it. That was, that was something they did and he made it happen, right? Um, maybe for others of you, it could be rejoining Peace Corps, you know, and, and as you well know, I think all of you, you could certainly consider doing Peace Corps post-retirement. Um, it is more and more common and they're oftentimes looking for, they really want more diversity and including, you know, age diversity. I think that they acknowledge and recognize that, you know, the lifetime of experience that you have from your career can be very valuable in Peace Corps. And in many cultures, such as Ecuador, where I served and many, many others, you know, the elder population, right, are revered more. They're, they're you know, looked up to. Sadly, in our country, I don't feel like this is 
as often the case. And that's a real tragedy because, you know, there's just such knowledge and expertise and just, you know, all of that in the, in the, um, you know, retired community and such. So, um, but this is a way to continue giving back. You could certainly think about doing that and you could potentially even do it multiple times. I've known people who have done it for years from one country to another country and they've bounced all over. And as long as they've been able to, you know, clear the medical and, and that type of thing, they've been able to um, really make a difference and continue in that, which is really exciting. Um, are there any questions at this point? I don't see any. I'm looking at the chat box. Danielle, unless I um, missed anything, uh, I don't see any, any questions. No, I don't see any questions okay. either. Please put them into the chat box if you do have them at this point. And um, we'll, uh, I'll go ahead and, and try to, um, I'll try to answer those as much as possible, okay? So um, how to find your niche, okay? Your, your kind of your niche, your niche focus of, you know, what, um, what you might want to do in retirement, right? And the number one thing that I have on there is networking, of course, because networking is key. Talking to other retirees, right? Gathering ideas. What are they doing? What, you know, what has brought them passion? What have they learned along the way? All of those kinds of things, right? It's kind of like a career chat or the old school informational interview, which I hate that term just because it sounds so long. But, you know, having a career chat, 15, 20 minute career chat with somebody who, you know, you'd love to hear more about their their own work, um, their own post Peace Corps um, I'm sorry, post retirement work and all of that. So that can be a really great idea. LinkedIn, I know a lot of folks, um, you know, who, the 50 plus category and such, and, and I'm in that category as well. And I think I was reluctant to LinkedIn in the beginning. I'm actually, you know, definitely on it. It, it definitely is the most powerful um networking connector, if you will, when you're trying to find people working in certain organizations or, you know, with whatever, and you have commonalities with many of them. So you could always do a search looking for fellow returned Peace Corps volunteers. It would be the former employer was Peace Corps, current employer or field or whatever it is you fill in the blank. And you could find all these, you know, people um, to network with, which can be really helpful. And you can do that online. I know we're all tired of the virtual and screen time and all of that. Someday in the not so distant future, I have dreams that it will return to life pre or some variation thereof um, where you can actually do in person as well. But that's great for you because wherever you live, you can certainly connect with people that are in a lot of different areas. Uh, reflect also, you know, this gets to a little bit of what we were saying before, you know, jobs, activities, you know, interests in the past that have brought you joy that have brought you fulfillment? You know, what are you most proud of? You know, what, what has brought you much, uh, most fulfillment? And then of course, there's some books that are really great. And I'm sure, you know, many of you know of, um, well, What Color Is Your Parachute, right? That is a huge uh, book that most everyone, you know, knows of that one. Um, what I will say is this, there is a special edition for retirement. So I would strongly encourage folks to um, check that out because I'll tell you their their regular book, their their career decision making and job search book, is the in my mind it's still it's the classic, the most classic book, and I think it's still the best. It's a great book and it's updated every year. So the retirement version, I don't know if they update it every year, you know, but it's updated quite frequently. So I think you'll find really valuable information um, in that as well. Uh, so that's just one of the books. Does anyone else have ideas of other books that you found helpful in helping you think about your own retirement and what kind of work you might want to do, how to find your, your niche? If so, please either unmute yourself and share or share them in the chat box and everyone can, can certainly save the chat box to your, um, I'll tell you how to do that in the end and you can take a look at it at your convenience. All righty. So let's, um, it really comes down to identifying your sweet spot, right? What brings you joy and what you're good at, right? That's kind of those two things um, and what's needed. It can really be kind of that three part if you think about it. What's the need in, in society um, now, that, that kind of thing. So it's really, and it's the opportunity to pivot more to what you love or the cause you believe in 
rather than just, you know, whatever your job was or the income and feeling maybe trapped or, you know, oh, I'm so close to retirement. I should just stick it out and stay here until I retire. This at least lets you think about, you know, when you retire that sweet spot and how to, how to pivot in a way that makes sense. Okay. Great. Is there any resources that anybody put in, Ron or anyone else? Um, I know you probably have some great ones. So the pros of, of post-retirement, uh, whether it's employment, activity, or endeavors, um, it it really you have you have more flexibility, right? It's it's and and you work with the flexibility that you have. You're retired, you know, so you have generally the option of saying yes or no. No, and if you're doing volunteer work, when you're able and when you're not able, and how much you can handle, how much you you know is too much. So um, that's that's the great thing. You can really focus on you and what brings you joy and and what your you know passion areas are, um, and you can really focus on like I said earlier with the self activities that bring you joy. Like I want to go around the world, I want to travel, or I want to learn the piano, or whatever. Versus you know the and there might be other activities that you want to do that are more you know I want to give back to others, make a difference for whatever population that kind of thing. Okay, so. And then ways to identify, you know, sources of meaningful engagement, right? And I have the picture of Jimmy Carter here because he's just my inspiration. He's amazing. And it's incredible that he's working, you know, into his 90s and, and still out there with the hammer doing his Habitat for Humanity, you know, work and all of that. He's just, he doesn't, he just doesn't stop, which I think is amazing. Uh, but things that you might want to consider, some sources. And then I want to really do a brainstorm. So if you can think of any ones other than what's on this list, please dump them into the chat box now uh, so that we can get those um, on the list and we can talk about them a little bit, or you can talk about them or I can talk about them. So Senior Core or Encore is a great one, right? AmeriCorps has that program with Senior Core or Encore, which I like that encore like back i love that out of retirement right um so they have some really good opportunities that you can check out if you go to i believe it's just americorps.gov and then i think that's what it is if you just do a google search on senior core or encore americorps you'll get information and there are opportunities all over the states so um wherever you're listening in from there definitely are opportunities that you could um consider right Peace Corps, a second round I've already mentioned, you know, and going maybe multiple times or, you know, one other time, that's great. But another one on here that I really talk about a lot to folks is called, it's a resource, it's called volunteermatch.org is the website, it's Volunteer Match. Volunteermatch.org is a site, it's an organization that they basically, you plug in, it's like a database, you plug in your, um, or a search engine, you, you plug in your, like, um, your where you live, your city and state, and then you plug in, you know, whatever your keywords are, and there might be a distance from my like, okay, maximum of, of 30 miles away or whatever. You plug that in. And then your keywords are things like areas that you're passionate about. So is it education? Is it tutoring? Is it um, environmental? What is it? You know, uh, that that you're want to find organizations that work in those areas. What will happen is we'll spit out a list of many organizations, many of which you will not have even maybe heard about that are coded as doing work in that area. So the great thing about that is it helps you identify organizations that you could then connect with and say, hey, I am entering retirement and I'm really looking to give back and do some volunteer work. My passion area is in the area of education or whatever, da, 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 da. and I found you on Volunteer Match. And I'm wondering what if any opportunities do you have for volunteers such as myself? I mean, let me tell you, nonprofits love to hear from people who want to be volunteers. Obviously, they are oftentimes run on a shoestring budget, so they don't have a big budget, right? But they love to hear, um, you know, from, from people who, you know, want to volunteer, right? But the other great reason is it's great for the job search too. So share this with, you know, others who may be in a, in a standard job search, right? Or thinking about what they want to move into. It's a great opportunity to do some volunteer work in, an, in a sector that you're interested in so that you can, one, become an insider, if you will, right? You're volunteering for that organization. You're part of their flock. You're doing that kind of work. And then you see opportunities that come up and you're like, oh my gosh, this looks like a great opportunity. Are you familiar with this at all? One of the colleagues, they might be able to put you in touch. You know, that's how it works, right? Or, you know, they might reach out to you. You don't even know about an, you know, an opportunity and say, hey, 
you know, Susan, you have been such a great volunteer. Is there any way you'd be interested in a paid opportunity or a staff opportunity full-time or part-time or whatever, right? So I, that's one of my favorite recommendations to give people on, you know, finding organizations doing the work they love, whether it's for a job search, traditional job search, or a job search into retirement, or just finding um, fun things. Oh, great. There's some good stuff coming in here. I see Idealist, which is a great one. Um, I love I love uh, Idealist. That's a, that's a really good, idealist.org. Um, they have thousands of, there's so many jobs on there. And, and, you know, now I think many, many of those are, you know, paid jobs as well, like regular, you know, types of jobs. And, and um, but I think they do have some volunteer um, areas as well. So great. Um, Woof.net. Now, did you mean the extra, is there supposed to be that extra W? I forget in there, in the woofing woof, right. Um, I just forget if it's two W's or one W, woof.net. Christine, I'm talking to you. I'm sorry. Yes. So that is their website. So it is the two W's. So www.oof.net. Got it. Thank you. These are great. Can you um, talk a little bit about that one, Christine? Would you mind sharing a few words on, you know, what that one focuses on or what their specialty is? Sure. I could do that. Um, because great. I've had had experience with woofing um, in the last few years. First, I had first of all, I had uh, a woofer here on my small farmette uh, for a summer, oh. and um, because I needed help, I had alpacas, yeah. and goats, and lots of work to do, and and I sure. did need um, someone to come out and stay at my place. There's no money exchanged, however. Um, you are expected to provide them with room and board, basically. Okay. So after I had my woofers here for a summer, I had to go to France to a, a family wedding. And I mm -hmm. decided since I was paying that much money for a, a ticket. Yeah. In Europe, I would stay longer than the week. So right. I um, got looked into the woofing in France. You can go anywhere, basically. Oh, wow. Even the Galapagos Ghost Islands has a uh, opportunity to woof. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So um, anyway, I went to um, and stayed with a family on an organic dairy goat farm and they made uh, also produced cheese and uh -huh. all, you know, all, you know, all the stuff related to goat milk. So I stayed with them for two weeks. Oh, that's and, great. Uh, I spent 20 euros in two weeks on chocolate. Oh. <laughs> Because everything else was provided. That's awesome. Oh my gosh, how incredible. Yeah, so um, I stayed with a family in France and um, it was a rural area, but it was a wonderful cultural experience as well. So, I mean, at least if you want to travel on a dime, um, like I said, it's a totally volunteer. No money is exchanged. It's a great way to do that. Um, that is awesome. No, I love that. And, you know, I have heard of Woof, but um, I have not, I didn't have that detailed of a, thank you for sharing that because that really helps clarify how it exactly works. And, and, um, and I love that it's all over the world. Like how, how cool is that? Right. I mean, what a great opportunity to think of a unique way to take a vacation, a very inexpensive vacation that might be if you're, you know, retired and, and to, you know, get away and get to another country and maybe work for a couple of weeks on a farm or whatever and, and have the free room and board and just experience life there. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. I think you have to pay like five or $10 to, to join okay. get into the website. And then from there, it's totally open and you just start searching. Yep. Yep. No, absolutely. That is great. That's great. Um, and then um, we have, um, I'm going to, there are some questions that are in the chat box that I want to make sure that we'll get to. And I will, I just want to go from this page, mentoring and coaching. Like, you know, that's one of the things that you can really look into as well as, you know, being that mentor, you, you've you gained this world of experience and, and, you know, all of that, that I like, I think a lot of times mentoring or even coaching, some people were, you know, move into coaching as a paid occupation and we're going to talk about some more, you know, paid things as well, right? Um, but but you can certainly, you know, you might be a consultant um, with some kind of expertise that might be good, you know, that you could certainly, you know, market. Or you might be talking more about life coaching or career coaching or things like that, where you might go and get, you know, your accreditation, which doesn't take that long, or, you know, there's different programs and such out there. So there's other ways to do that, either for a pay, on a paid basis or as a, a volunteer, depending on your situation and 
and your desires. So um, I want to, um, from here, I want to make sure uh, we, we now have time for the, for the questions. I want to go back up to uh, Melissa's uh, question. Do you have more information on age requirements for federal jobs? I've seen some limitations to age 60 cutoff. Yes, you are right with some. Um, I do not have a listing of which government agencies where it's, you know, 60, but I know there are, for example, with uh, foreign service, you are, you have to retire at a certain age. I don't know if it's 60. You also have to have been able to put in X number of tours. So I think there's, there's a, there's a uh, date that's the latest at which you could join state department. Like, you know, you pass the test and you do all of that. When you join them for your foreign service career, you have to um, be, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the exact, um, but you could do a Google search on, you know, foreign service, you know, uh, requirements, you know, minimum, maximum age require, or not minimum, ex, maximum age requirements and, you know, see, see what they, what they shared there. But you could also do that with other federal agencies, right? Certain, certain occupations, that um, that are coded as okay. This has maybe an earlier right um, retirement date than than you know sixty five the standard, but most in in federal service right you know as you get older and you're there and you're nearing retirement, there are people who decide to stay beyond the typical sixty five, and oftentimes, very oftentimes, there's no maximum age. And in fact, in government, you probably have more, you do have more security for your, your job, not like being done away with or just, okay, thanks, you've given us 20 years, 30 years, whatever, bye-bye, and forcing you out the door. That can happen in certain industries, right? More in the private sector and things like that. There's not that ob obligation or that built-in kind of protection, right? Um, but yeah, so so uh, there are some, and I would say just do a quick Google search on, you know, what are the you know age requirements for federal jobs and you know retirement, and you'll get some more information. Unless somebody else in here, if anyone has more information from your own. Uh, experience within the federal government, please unmute yourself and let's um, let's hear what you have to say. Happy to hear it. If you do have experience in it, just unmute yourself. Otherwise, that's fine. Hey, Julie. Yeah. Hi, this is Ron. Hey. Uh, uh, so the uh, two other agencies that uh, I've recently done research on, uh, USAID has that, that same policy where it's uh, 59, and yeah. then uh, I mean, and then there's a, a review process that that they go through in order to stay on. Uh, the other one uh, that that I did a lot more research on was CDC, and CDC does not have an age limitation Great. on employment with them. So they they you, yeah you pretty much go with them until you just fall over head so it, well until or you want to retire right i mean that's what my experience has been in federal government it's more you as the employee more dictate you know i'm ready to retire or i'm not right. and they don't you know necessarily kick you out of the door I, I think there's a lot more protections for you know employees in that regard right so thank you for sharing ronnie i appreciate that and i'm going to get to your question in a moment first i'm going to take melissa's question about um, she'd appreciate discussion and resources for older job seekers that leverage our skills and experience, um, not just a job of expediency or convenience, absolutely, right? So I understand LinkedIn is certainly a resource, any others. Yeah, if you're, I mean, there are many jobs that are going to um, value and in industries that will value from your expertise, right? And your, um, you know, your your background, right? It's, it's a matter of, it really like, any other job seeker, right? But there's there's certain ones that would be maybe more conducive or more appropriate for somebody, you know, with maybe your certain technical expertise. That really depends on you, as a, like what are your skills and and experience that you bring. Um, LinkedIn, yes, is an area that you can get a lot of ideas um, from people who do similar types of things, right? Um, you can also, uh, in, in addition to LinkedIn, just, you know, really tapping into, as I said, the, your networking connection and building your community, 
join some of the groups that are on LinkedIn or Facebook where you encounter new people beyond your usual. And that way you can kind of even look them up on LinkedIn and be like, well, what, what do they do? What's their background? They sound like they have an interesting background. So you then you can learn from that profile before you even talk to them. You can learn a little more about, okay, this is what they did. Well, that could be a cool thing to do, right? How about also throwing something up on you know your social media if it's not a secret that you're looking for something, right? If you're approaching retirement and you're like, hey, put it out, you know, a Facebook post or whatever, you know, saying, Hey, I'm near, you know, approaching retirement quickly. And I'm looking for, you know, or not retire. Maybe you're not looking to retire. Like you said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to pivot to careers in whatever I'm, I'm looking um, to, you know, uh, explore opportunities that would value the, the tenure and expertise of someone with my background any tips or advice? Do you know anyone or, you know, any, any tips or advice you would have for me? See what they have to say. Your circle's going to come back. They're going to have ideas. They're going to have connections generally that they can connect you to. And you can find out because again, it's so much of it is about networking. I mean, it's, I mean, I know people are, people will say, I want to get a job because of, you know, what I know, not who I know. Well, and that's fine. You will still have to know what you need to know. Trust me. But networking accounts for a huge percentage. There's a lot of different stats you'll see, but you'll see generally between 70 and 80 some percent of jobs are gotten through, you know, networking, right? In, in some way or another, right? Being connected. Now that doesn't count your federal jobs that are open to all US citizens because that's a whole different required, you know, aspect and ball game, but your private sector, your nonprofit, that kind of area, it's huge. So I just don't want to uh, underscore, I can't underscore uh, LinkedIn and, and networking enough. Um, are there other ones that people want to add to that? Uh, because she was, you know, looking for other resources for older job seekers that leverage our skills and experience, you know, um, so not link in addition to LinkedIn, what other suggestions would some of the rest of you have for Carrie? Feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to say it or write it in the chat box if you prefer. Hi, Jody. Uh, if I can just kind of uh, uh, add a little bit more to my question, I hope sure. everything's been good. Yeah. So uh, what it is is that uh, uh, so the nature of my work goes from project to project, uh -huh. and which is great. But I'm getting nervous because as I get older. Uh, and that includes both my level of skill, but also my salary requirements or my yeah. salary history. Mm -hmm. it, it, I just, I just am worried about it becoming increasingly a barrier. Yeah. And so what, and so I do understand the value of networking. That really is a big piece of, uh, of the way my work works is it certainly everyone yeah. that I know, but I was just curious if there was any other resources or any other uh, uh, groups or network platforms that uh, really can appreciate an older uh, employee yeah. as opposed to it being a barrier, meaning we hire younger because they're less expensive and we hire younger okay. because for yeah. whatever reason, yeah. I just was wondering if there was something a little bit more that I can just go to that yeah. helps alleviate some of these concerns. Yeah, and you know, um, it, people, it, people that might wanna weigh in, feel free to do so. You can certainly, you know, chat. I'm gonna make a comment First, just based on what you were saying, Carrie, I think that's a really good point that you make. It sounds like you're more of a consultant type of like it's project to project. So you don't have that. Um, maybe is that right? You don't have that maybe security of. Is that right? Uh, sorry, if my new buttons are getting confused. Yes, that no is problem. correct. It's yep. yes, the yep. nature of the work is international yep. development. And, yep. and even as you know, project, even if you work for an organization in international development, projects end and then you still have to get moved to another project or go work for another organization. That's just yeah. the nature of my work. And Right. And, and yeah. yeah. And you're doing bids too, right? They're bidding. And if you win it, then you get to do it. If you right. don't, they exactly. go with another, right? Yeah. 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 That's stressful. I, I actually know people who've worked in um, in that arena and it can be, it's not for the, I don't want to say faint of heart, but it's, it's not for somebody who has any kind of anxiety around like, you know, the, the future or, or uh, you know, only because it, it is so well, we hope we're going to get it. We think we'll get it. And then, you know, if you do or don't, you've got to be able to really like, you know, change direction and go with something else or find, get out, get added to another project. I mean, it's just, I, that is stressful. I, I totally get it. Um, I, what I would say while we wait for some things to come in, there's three new comments. Maybe somebody has actually 
um, weighty. And actually somebody has said, uh, thank you, Carrie, my sentiments exactly on the work history, but also the anxiety. Yeah. I mean, that it, that is, that is very stressful. I, I'm, um, I, I agree. Absolutely. Um, the tips that I would have for you would be, I mean, if you are considering, it sounds like, you know, you're, you're not at the age of retirement right now, right? It doesn't sound like you're any really close to that right now. And so, um, I honor the challenge that you said you, you feel like, you know, you face or you can face when competing against the younger crew, because you have a well-deserved and established salary history. That's going to be higher than somebody with five years of experience, right? Or, you know, that they can hire in at a lower amount. And, and so they do know that, right? So part of what that comes down to is when you apply for a job, um, making yourself, not making yourself so blatantly a like seasoned, seasoned professional, right? 25 years of expertise and da, 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 right? If they're asking for five, right? Or, or seven or whatever. Um, you can limit the amount, and I hate to say that, but really limiting the amount of experience, because honestly, in general, other than federal government, you really shouldn't, you generally don't have more than a two-page resume. Well, not very much fits on two page if you're like close to retirement, right? And there's a lot of history that you have. So you have to think of ways that you could shorten, emphasize more the more recent work that you've done, because that can that can also just hide a little bit more of that. Like how, you, know, you wouldn't want to put also your your dates of um, graduation from college, 1990, 1986, you know, whatever you because that really marks you, right? That, oh, they're going to retire in two years, three years. Oh, they don't want to invest that in you if they think that you're going to retire right away, right? And then the other thing that you really do need to do, you just need to be, uh, be prepared and ready to address that head on. They're not going to say, oh, you're too old. They would never say that, right? Because that would be discrimination and all that. But you need to be able to come out with examples that really show that and really market your resume and your, your responses in your interview to that whole, you know, concept of being in touch with, you know, LinkedIn, Trello, whatever the kinds of things that they use, right? You know, the platforms that others use. You can, you can get up to speed on those if you're not already and really emphasize your technical skills because a lot of times they do assume that you're not going to have technical skills if you're 50 plus. You, you're not a digital native, you didn't grow up with it, whatever. And that's not always true. Now, you know, I, you know, I'm, I, I would say, you know, I would never say that technology is my like niche that I would want to work in. No way. That is so not the case, but I do know how to, da, 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 da. and so you want to really plug what you do know and maybe take a course or take, you know, come up to speed and in some ways too, so that you're more uh, competitive um, with the others as well is what I would say. But it sounds to me like you're really looking at the regular job cert job, you know, arena, and that's awesome. And you should do that, but you do need to make yourself marketable and not overly like so experienced. Like we can't afford him. He'll be too expensive or he'll leave tomorrow and retire. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Oh, uh, is there uh, so the, all, everything you just said is helpful. Is there any kind of, um, a concise uh, resource uh, like this, meaning I know uh, you've led uh, career counseling uh, workshops, et cetera, where you list all of these types of uh, ideas. Yep. Is there something like that or another kind of a uh, uh, seminar? Yeah, no, we, um, Danielle shared a little bit ago in the chat box. Danielle, can you jump that, uh, jump, dump that in again, just in case uh, Carrie wasn't on by then? All of the webinars that I've been that I've done in the past, and several of them have focused more on like the you know seasoned professional and you know whatever to, to when you're doing a resume for that or when you're do, you're interviewing for that. So there's definitely that, and there's a lot of online resources um, as well. You're I'm happy to have you reach out to me as well, Carrie, if you would like to chat a little more. I can steer you to some more resources that might be helpful um, for you in this process. You can just reach me at uh, Jody at rpcv.org is the short one. Short right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Happy to help. Um, okay, so let's see. I have, um, I'm going to come back to your question. I promise. I just want to see here. Some folks have to drop off, which I totally understand because we're, we're, we are at that, um, at that time. So um, let's see. 62 years correct for UN mission members as opposed to permanent staff. Ooh, Judith, I'm not 100% sure if somebody knows here without doing or can do a quick uh, check. A Google check on, you know, UN mission members, um, retirement, mandated retirement age, something like that, you'll get the answer. 
you know, versus or or mission members versus permanent staff, retirement ages, something like that, you'll get it. I mean, you know, Google's my my best friend, I always say. Okay, I also want to get back to Ronnie's question, which was about uh, Peace Corps. And um, you said uh, that doing the current Peace Corps policy is that the current term limit is three years with an intervening time off. Any changes? Now, that's interesting, Ronnie. That's different than I recall it. I know that there was some changes being made, but I did not think that it was three years maximum. Like if you were there for two years of your service and then, you know, uh, an extension for a year that you couldn't stay for one more year. Um, I know that there was back and forth about the value of, you know, is it more, is, is it more valuable to have somebody who's seasoned, who already knows the system, who can be, you know, so productive because they've already done the whatever. And the answer when I was serving in the nineties was yes. So extensions were allowed and there weren't as many, um, you know, uh, restrictions. Now they didn't design it to be necessarily something that you would do for a total career. You would have to take some breaks. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I know somebody who was in a very niche area, you know, rabbit, um, farming and, you know, that kind of thing. And he was able to do it multiple times all over the world, which was great. Every once in a while, I'd have to take a, a break, but you would need to really contact Peace Corps. Um, just go to their connect with a recruiter and ask that question. They'll be able to answer it for you. What's the current maximum yeah, age? Okay, let's look here at the, at the end. Um, let's see. Oh, Melissa, what email are you using for me that it says it's coming back uh, undeliverable because that's incorrect. Let me um, have Danielle drop that into the chat box for me. Thank you so much. You can either use my Jody, J-O-D-I at peacecoreconnect.org. That's the long one. Or Jody, J-O-D-I at rpcv.org. Either one should work. And if you still have trouble with that, um, email the general uh, inbox for Peace Corps at, you know, RPCV or whatever, and, and see what uh, what's going on, because I hope I'm not missing emails. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. All right. Um, I want to acknowledge everyone's uh, time here. Thank you so much for, for joining me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording here. And then if people want to stick around, I can stick around for a few minutes and certainly answer other questions, you know, off, off record here. So um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today and taking this time. And I look forward to future, future events. Please be sure to check out our events on Peace Corps connect.org slash events, which is our event page. Um, we do have, if some of you are mid-career professionals and are interested, we do have an upcoming, uh, starting April 15th, we have an upcoming boot camp that's called Mid-Career Relaunch Boot Camp. If you're looking to pivot and really, you know, make a significant change or a change, right, and you're a mid-career professional, um, you could certainly participate in that. That is starting. If you're interested in more information, go to the events page for uh, April 15th. 15th and you'll have when you it's the first of four sessions it's four weekly sessions mm -hmm. if you don't know what you want to pivot to but you want to pivot and you're a mid-career professional you will be able to join us for our pre-boot camp which is more individualized small group work focused to help you gain a sense of maybe what you would what kinds of opportunities you want to explore so that when you get into the boot camp that starts the 15th um, you'd be of, of April, you'd be able to go from there. So it starts either on the 15th of April for the standard or the 1st of April, if you're going to take um, in the additional pre-boot camp, if you don't know what you want to do. So I hope that's helpful. And please, uh, I welcome you back for any and all of our topics. And please let us know if there are topics that you suggest. Um, there are other topics that I've thought of even during the, you know, pursuit of this one, just, you know, talking with you all, please dump them in the chat box or, um, you know, send them to me by email. I would love to hear from you and we'd love to uh, incorporate as much as we can to best meet your needs. And lastly, please let others know, let, let the other RPCV community, the NPCA members that you know, know about what we have to offer and how we can help. Thanks so much, everyone, and make it a great day. Thank you.